afternoon, everyone. I am Ernestine Briggs King, an associate professor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences. And I'd like to welcome you to the sixth and the last webinar in the Taking Care of Yourself and Your Loved One series. This series is designed to help support the mental health and well being of our faculty, staff, trainees, and students. Today, we're going to discuss mental health in children and adolescents of color, a group that's at heightened risk of mental health challenges due to their exposure to racism, trauma, violence, and other stressors. In this webinar, Dr. Erica Duraza will discuss the mental health impact of COVID-19 on youth, how the intersection of racism and the pandemic affect youth of color, how to detect warning signs that your child may be suffering from a mental illness. Dr. Duraza is a double board certified child and adolescent psychiatrist who's been committed to serving individuals and family impacted by psychiatric conditions for over 15 years. She's passionate about education, increasing mental health awareness, breaking down barriers of stigma and addressing and eliminating health disparities that impact individuals from diverse ethnic backgrounds. Dr. DeRaza specializes in the treatment of eating disorders, mood disorders, anxiety disorders, ADHD, autism spectrum disorders, and a range of other topics for children and adults. In addition to several leadership roles in statewide and national professional organization, she serves on the executive board of Project Heal, a nonprofit organization which helps to eliminate disparities in access to eating disorder treatment. Dr. DeRaza earned her bachelor's of science at Spelman College, master's of public health and healthcare and leadership at UNC Chapel Hill, and her doctorate of medicine at Duke University School of Medicine. She completed her adult psychiatry residency and her child and adolescent psychiatry fellowship at Duke University. She's the co-founder and partner of Catalyst Therapeutic Services, LLC in Durham, North Carolina, and she serves as a consultant associate for the Duke University School of Medicine. And before I turn it over to Dr. DeRaza, just a few quick notes about submitting questions today. You can use your Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen to ask a question at any time during the webinar, but we'll hold off on responding to questions until the end of Dr. DeRaza's presentation. Please note that you do have an option to ask a question anonymously. And now, welcome Dr. DeRaza and thank you for being here today. Hi, thank you so much. Um, thank you for that wonderful welcome, Dr. Briggs King. And it's so great to be here today. I see a lot of quote unquote familiar faces in the audience um, today. I wish I could see you in person, um, but that day will soon come. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so we can get this presentation started because we don't have a lot of time. <laughs> All right. So today I'll be talking about mental health and COVID-19 and particularly about how these two issues are impacting our youth of color. And I have about 20 minutes to do so, so bear with me. <laughs> I don't have any disclosures to present today. So I wanted to share this. This was actually shared by um, a, a doctor, Dr. Walker over at UNC. She and I did a presentation together. And I found that this slide was just so profound um, because it really talks about how parents view um, COVID-19 and what their top concerns are for their children. And over 2000 parents were actually polled for this questionnaire. And it's really interesting when you look at the top 10 concerns amongst 
white parents compared to Latino parents and then compared to black parents. And as you can see here, if you look at white parents, of course, there are going to be concerns with COVID-19, with the overuse of social media. I know as a child psychiatrist, I see that quite a bit. There are concerns about bullying, cyberbullying, internet safety, unhealthy eating, and the list goes on. When we look over at the Hispanic parents, we see some of the similar concerns with overuse of social media, bullying, internet safety, um, also drug use, um, but we see racism start to appear. And then we, we move over towards the left of the slide and we see black parents. It really is interesting that the number one concern for their, their children and their teenagers is actually racism. In, in the setting of this pandemic. And I think that is just so profound. And when we also look at what else is there, number two is COVID. And then we look further down the list, we see poverty, which wasn't necessarily listed for um, the Hispanic, as a top 10 concern for Hispanic parents or white parents. Then go a little farther down the line, we see unequal healthcare access. And then of course, lastly, gun injuries. So this slide to me is so interesting because again, racism comes up as a number one priority for parents who have children of color. And it's understandable why, because when we see images on the news, we see images in newspapers, this is what we're seeing. This is what we're experiencing every single day. And this is taken from a Black Lives Matter protest. And as you could see, this child looks to be, to me, no older than three or four years old. What's really interesting, um, when I first saw this, I actually, I cried and I've presented on this topic many, many times. And I have to say the last time I presented this, it was on the heels of the, um, the trial last week. And I did, I cried when I presented this slide just because, no one should ever point their guns at a young little baby, a baby, this is a baby. Um, but our youth, our youth of color are seeing these images, you all, every single day, not only the images like this, but they're seeing what happened to Adam Toledo, that he was murdered by the police. And then of course, we just finished watching the very highly emotional funeral for Dante Wright. Again, our children and our youth are seeing these images they're talking about these cases amongst themselves and with their families. And then of course, Makia Bryant, which just happened last week. You know, what's interesting about the images and everything that our children and our youth are seeing is that they are making comparisons to their own lives and to their, their parents' lives. When they see these images and they hear these stories about black youth being killed and murdered at the hands of people who are supposed to protect them. What's really interesting is I, I actually just saw a young lady just last week um, and it was after the verdict of the trial, um, Derek Chauvin trial, and she had just heard about Makia Bryant being murdered by the police. And that next morning she said she went to school and this is one of the first weeks she's been back in school. Some of the schools are in person now in Raleigh. And the teacher looked around and she asked everyone, which normally most teachers would, how's everybody doing today? And I met with this young lady later on that day and she said, she just cried. She just cried. And the teacher said, what, are, what on earth are you crying about? What's going on? And she was just like, have you seen the news lately? This is just too much. I'm afraid for my own life. I'm afraid for my parents. And when she came to talk to me, she actually said, something that was so profound. Number one, because of the images that she's seeing, she's actually experiencing tra traumatic symptoms. So she's having a hard time going to sleep. She's finding herself being very hypervigilant with an increased startle response. She's worried about the safety of herself, scared to go to bed at night because what if somebody breaks into my house and kills me like they did Breonna Taylor? Um, worried about her parents coming home, worrying about her siblings, whether or not they're going to be safe. And she said, you know, what's interesting to me, Dr. Jarasa, is my friends, it's not even a concern. They don't even have to worry about these things. They're worrying about their nails or they're worrying about what they're going to wear to school or they're, they may be worrying about whether or not they've been excluded from a group chat. And here I am worrying about whether or not I'm going to die when I go to sleep at night. It's just not fair. And, and I told her, you're right, it's, it isn't fair. 
it isn't fair that you are having to experience this. And one of the things that I encouraged her to do was to find people, like-minded people who would at least be willing to hear her out and to share their stories that they can find support with one another um, for her to talk to her parents about it. Of course, she, she felt open to talk to me about it, um, but also to help, help her say, you know what? You don't have to plug into the TV all the time. You don't have to watch the news. Maybe we need to take a social media break um, because seeing these images and hearing about these stories is traumatic. In addition to that, we see not only, and I have, <laughs> welcome to my little puppy Theo who just woke up. <laughs> um, but in addition to that, when we think about COVID and the intersection of racism, we have to think about the financial implications. So this is a study that was done by the Commonwealth Fund. And what we see here is that Black families and Latino families are disproportionately affected by COVID. They are suffering from um, economic consequences like no one else before. They are having to borrow money, take out loans. They, over 50% of Latinos have used up all of their savings. And then they're not able to afford for basic things like food or heat or rent. So we're thinking about, okay, yes, we're worried about COVID, but we're also thinking about, okay, what's happening in terms of um, structural racism, right? Which has led to inequities, um, not only in terms of police brutality, but also finances, housing inequities, um, food insecurity. So we can't neglect the fact that COVID is exacerbating all of these issues that already existed, of course, before COVID-19. And then when we think about COVID-19 and, and just the impact it's had on, um, on Americans in terms of lives lost, we see that indig indigenous people are suffering the most actually. Um, they're over three times more likely to die from COVID-19 than white or Asian Americans. And that number is also very high for Latino Americans and black Americans. So not only are we experiencing um, the financial issues, the racism, seeing these images, but we're also actually dying at higher rates of COVID-19, which again is highlighting something that's existed. We've known for several, several years that health disparities are an issue, but now they're being magnified by COVID-19. So as we can see, there's a huge burden of COVID-19 that it takes on our families and particularly those of color. We talked about financial burdens and food insecurity. Another thing that I didn't talk about so much was just lack of supervision. There are some families that have no choice but to go in um, and work. You know, they had no choice. They weren't able to necessarily work from home. I actually am working with a family now. It's a single mom, she's a nurse. Um, and her children have been at home when she thought they were on Zoom logging on, but they, she didn't realize that rather than them just seeming like they're teenagers, they actually were depressed. They were actually depressed and they found themselves um, being more isolated, more withdrawn. They weren't logging into school every day. And it wasn't until the end of this semester that the teacher realized the kids hadn't been logging in to their classes every day. Well, she hadn't known that. The teacher didn't pick up on it until the end because the teachers are overwhelmed. So her kids are failing all of their classes and she had no idea until it was too late. So that just goes to show you, she had no one to come home and check up on her kids. They're in high school. She thought they would be able to do well. They've been A students their entire lives. So of course her assumption was that they were responsible enough to log into school on their own. They were excellent, amazing students. However, again, because they didn't have the supervision, she had to work, and because they were overlooked in their school system, it wasn't until the end of the year that now we're, we're all scrambling trying to figure out how they can now pass their classes. Um, we're seeing higher rates than ever before of domestic violence, emotional abuse, and physical abuse. We're also seeing higher rates of substance use, not only in parents, but also in the kids and teenagers. And I actually thought, 
that would be something that would decrease. I was like, well, they may not be able to get access as much if they're not hanging out with their friends, but they find a way. And I'm seeing higher rates. Um, of course, I don't have data or numbers just yet. I think the numbers are still coming in um, as we see just the implications and manifestations of how COVID is impacting our youth. But I can tell you in my private practice, I'm seeing skyrocketing alarming rates of marijuana use, of vaping, even alcohol use. And of course, we all know we've been told to socially distance, but we are now seeing our children and our adolescents are having a hard time with that. Instead of just socially distancing, they're actually becoming more and more isolated. They're having a hard time adjusting because of significant changes in their routine, a lack of structure. They're also experiencing high rates of anticipatory anxiety now that we are reintroducing them back into the school systems. And then I talked a little bit about how Black youth, Latino youth, and Indigenous people are suffering from COVID at higher rates, which means, you know, they're experiencing family members who have died, um, close friends who have died from COVID-19. I think the last statistic I saw was that one out of maybe 400 or 500 Black Americans has died from this illness. So we're experiencing much higher rates of loss and grief in the setting of already grieving everything that we're experiencing in terms of racism and police brutality. And of course, that's leading to high levels of parental stress, which then makes it difficult sometimes for parents to really be present and to understand the needs of their children if they too are struggling with their own mental health. And then lastly, you can't forget, I talked already about health disparities and then Zoom fatigue. And I appreciate all of you here um, in the midst of Zoom fatigue. I know you all could be eating your lunch in peace and yet here you are engaging in this process and listening. So it, it takes a toll on us though. It absolutely takes a toll. But our youth are essentially at high risk. Why? Because they are in such a critical stage of their development. Emotionally, they're developing and where they're normally able to experience conflict and challenges in school, um, they're having a harder time managing that and learning how to um, engage with appropriate and healthy coping skills. Um, they're socially distanced, they're socially isolated. So I have so many children and youth telling me, you know, Dr. Droth, I forgot how to have a conversation. I don't even know what I would say if I go to this outing with my friends friends, what do I say? What do I do? Um, they're, they're impacted from a cognitive standpoint, even, even from a physical standpoint. We forget that, you know, our youth have not been able to engage in sports or dance or other arts in the way that they were able to before, and that can definitely impact them developmentally. Of course, if they have the right genetic predeterminating um, uh, factors that can lead them or predispose them to the development of psychiatric illness. If you com combine that with the right stressor and environmental stressor, that can put them at risk. And of course, family relationships. Again, we're seeing a lot more domestic violence. We're seeing stress in the home. Parents who are dealing with their own levels of depression and anxiety or substance use and how that's impacting our youth. And of course, trauma. And I talked a little bit about this earlier, but we are experiencing trauma like never before, whether it's in the household, whether it's in the community or vicariously through watching, again, black youth being killed day after day unnecessarily. So when we think about what are they um, predisposed to developing, well, any kind of psychiatric condition. Again, I can tell you that in my private practice, I'm seeing high rates of depression in youth, anxiety disorders, separation anxiety, um, social anxiety especially, seeing higher rates of OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, um, seeing higher rates of PTSD or trauma-like symptoms, especially that can be race racially based. Um, so they may not necessarily meet full criteria for PTSD, but again, I'm seeing youth who are endorsing hypervigilance, deep, um, irritability, lack of sleep, um, trauma nightmares um, because of the images that they're seeing. And that can of course lead to substance use disorders. 
Um, for the, those kids who already had pre-existing learning disorders or ADHD or even autism spectrum disorders, those disorders are becoming harder and harder to treat in the midst of COVID, especially when there's a lack of structure and routine in the home. So we're seeing higher rates of folks coming in just for a reevaluation of those symptoms or onset of new symptoms that have developed in, in this kind of setting where they're doing most of their learning online. So you may be asking, okay, well, what are the warning signs? How do we know if our child or our teenager needs help? Well, some things you may notice may be sadness or apathy. Maybe they're just not interested in things as much as they used to be anymore. Maybe they just have a I don't care kind of attitude. They may also be just much more sensitive or emotionally reactive. Maybe you tell them to do something or tell them they forgot to do something and they lash out or they yell. Maybe they're more irritable or more aggressive or may, more, may engage in more frequent or intense temper tantrums. They can also experience anxiety, which can lead to physical manifestations such as shortness of breath and health, heart palpitations and panic attacks, or they may just have a general sense of um, tension of high levels of anxiety that can result in irritability um, or even avoidance. They may be, become very avoidant. You may hear that they start to make negative statements about themselves um, or about the world, that there's no point in even being here. What's the point in even going to school or beyond? Nothing matters. So that can kind of go along with a sense of hopelessness or even a sense of shame and guilt. They, as I told you about that one family, they may have a significant change in their grades. So again, I'm seeing students who are A, B students making Ds and Fs and not really caring about it because they don't feel as though it will matter, especially if they're on a pass fail system. Changes in appetite, so that can be either decreased appetite or higher appetite, as well as changes in sleep, which can be losing sleep or sleeping a lot throughout the day. And of course, we can't forget about suicidal thoughts or self-harm and self-injurious behaviors. So what do we do or say if we suspect our child is suffering from mental illness? The first thing we wanna do, we wanna recognize those symptoms early. It's never too early to just question and say, you know, maybe this is something that we need to look into. We wanna create a welcoming and safe environment where our children and our youth can talk to us openly about what they're feeling and what they're experiencing without any judgment or criticism. It's okay to ask, but it's also okay to say what you're noticing and to express concern. It's okay to say, you know, I've noticed that you haven't been talking to your friends much and you haven't been playing your video games as much. Seems like you're spending a lot of time in your room. I'm wondering, is everything okay? Have you noticed that too? You know, it's okay to start a conversation with what your observations are, again, without making any judgment or criticism and giving them the space to really share openly what it is they're experiencing. And to say, you know, I'm not sure if this is what's going on, but I'm concerned that you may have depression. Let's talk about what that is. Or I'm concerned you may be dealing with um, social anxiety. Perhaps we can seek some resources so we can help you find some help because I do think this actually can be um, that you can be helped. I do think you can recover from this. We want to instill hope and help them see that they don't have to suffer in silence and they don't have to suffer alone. But there are, of course, some barriers to treatment, especially in youth. And here I'm talking mainly about Black youth, but this is also pretty true for Latinos and other Indigenous communities. And essentially, there is data showing that Black youth are less likely, li likely to receive a psychiatric diagnosis, to receive outpatient services, or to complete treatment, or receive culturally informed care. And there are lots of reasons for that. One, I think, is bias, especially on, in terms of our profession as medical providers. We have to really be sure that we are checking our bias when we're seeing a youth of color asking about depression, asking about anxiety, asking about eating disorders. All of those things can impact our youth. We also want to make sure that we acknowledge there's so many other barriers due to the history of medical maltreatment in this country that leads to um, resulting from racism or misunderstanding. Um, sometimes there's mistrust, right, in the providers. So that can be a barrier as well. Of course, stigma and shame, especially if we are seeing that our children or youth are suffering, we may sometimes point the blame towards ourselves as parents and, and then think that something is wrong with us. 
but there's no reason for you to experience that shame. It's much better to say, okay, let's acknowledge a problem and seek help where it's needed. Of course, though, there are other barriers, and this is important in that Black physicians are more likely to actually treat patient, Black patients. And when you ask Black families about that, they view Black physicians as, be, as being more participatory in their treatment. But we only represent 2% of psychiatrists, 2% of psychologists, and 4% of social workers. So that means there is absolutely no way if Black individuals make up 13 to 14% of the population for them to be seen by a Black provider. However, it is important that those other providers, that we all make sure that we are taking responsibility, that we are owning and understanding our own biases, that we are able to provide culturally informed and culturally relevant care and also learning more about how to become anti-racist in our in interactions with our patients and also when it comes to our institutions and how we deliver care in psychiatry. And then lastly, make sure that you're taking care of yourselves. Again, it's so easy um, to neglect our own health and well-being when we're taking care of the needs of our children. But we have to remember, right, to put our oxygen on first. Now, we hear that a lot when we go on a plane. And I know many of us have not been on a plane in over a year. Um, but we all know what the flight attendants tell us. And that's to put oxygen on first, even before the child next to us. And it doesn't make any sense. It seems so counterintuitive but it's necessary. My only change to that would be, let's not wait until an emergency to do that. Let's go ahead and place our oxygen on, for, on first every day. Let's check in with ourselves to be self-aware, to understand what's happening internally, to take care of ourselves. Hey, and maybe even to share. Mom, mom gets upset too when I see these images of racism. Let's talk about that. What are, what are ways we can learn how to grieve collectively as a family and, and as a community? And how can we make meaning? Maybe there's some things that we can do to promote wellness, to um, help promote justice that will help us actually feel better about the grieving process. Let's set the example for our youth and our children by taking care of ourselves. Um, over time, but that's all that I have today. If you need resources, here are some lovely resources. You can also email me at any time and check me out at Catalyst Therapeutic Services here in Durham. Also, I'm a consulting associate with the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences, and I have a clinic that I work with medical students on every Monday um, to take care of the needs of our medical students here in the Duke community. Um, I see children, adolescents, and young adults. So thank you all so much. I'm going to pass the baton back to you, Dr. Briggs King, so we can get oh, these questions answered. <laughs> Dr. Duraza, we could spend the whole another hour talking about this subject. It, it's just so... Yeah so relevant and so important of a topic. Uh, so I just wanna say thank you for just sharing all that great information with me. Um, with us, there, there, there are lots of questions coming in, but we only have time for just one. So I'm gonna sneak this okay. one in. <laughs> Hi, and thanks for this. My question is how to communicate with kids of color so that they do not receive the main message that the world is unsafe for them but also to give them information that they need, i.e. the truth, that there is unsafety for them in this world. So how do we balance it? Oh my goodness. And Chapman Price, what an amazing question. You're so right. I think I've been having conversations with families about the need to discuss race and implications of race. And I know um, speaking with the family just re recently about um, how do you teach your young men or boys. I remember my nephew having this conversation when he was nine and he said, you know, auntie, when I was a little baby, they thought I was cute, but now when they see me, they think I'm a threat. Why? So we have to have these conversations to help them understand how um, racism, <laughs> this is Theo, he's, he's done, <laughs> how racism can impact them as youth and, but also helping them understand there are people out there who care. There are people out there who are trying to make a change, right? And we think about all the changes that have happened over the decades, right? We've come a long way. We have such a long way to go though. So we want to be honest with them. We want to be truthful with them. It really is 
that balance of holding both spaces, right? Of holding that truth for them, but also holding hope that there are changes that are coming and that there are people that are here to protect them, right? Their families, or if not their families, maybe a mentor, there are doctors, there are people here who are willing and able to serve them and to make sure that they are protected. But such a great, great question. I could go on about that. That's a, that's yeah. a, that's a whole nother talk. Um, well, we're going to wrap here. But again, thank you for such a great presentation. This was just so well done. I appreciate it so much. Um, for those of you in the audience, within the next week, we'll share the recording, the slides, and related resources on the webinar a series webpage. The URL is in the chat box and materials from the first five webinars in the series are now available on that page. I want to end by noting that if you're struggling, know that you're not alone. We encourage and invite you to seek support and resources, including our department's emotional support and well-being phone line are listed at the bottom of the webinar series webpage. Take care and have a great afternoon.